Ladies and gentlemen, faculty, staff, alumni, and well-wishers of the Aachen University. Since we connected across the globe, assalamu alaikum and a very good morning, afternoon, and evening to each one of you. The Aachen University and the Department of Pediatrics and Child Health are extremely honored to host a series of these sessions, conversations with the experts. And today, being the first one of a series of six of these sessions, so we have nine eminent speakers from across four continents, and thereby we bring you the very best of pediatric critical care medicine from across the globe. You can all email your questions at pccmpark one at gmail.com. I repeat, it's pccmpark one at gmail.com, and this email address has already been shared with you once you're registered. So myself and my colleague, Dr. Naveed Rahman Siddiqui, shall be taking any questions that you may have at the end of these three talks. It gives me great privilege to announce our first speaker, Dr. Vinay Nathkarni. Okay. This is a name that needs no introduction in the world of resuscitation and pediatric critical care medicine. Dr. Nathkarni is a professor and endowed chair at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and Departments of Anesthesiology, Critical Care, and Pediatrics, University of Pennsylvania Perlman School of Medicine. He also happens to be the founding director for the CHOP Center for Pediatric Resuscitation and the CHOP Center for Simulation, Advanced Education, and Innovation. He currently serves on the Executive Committee for the Society of Critical Care Medicine. Dr. Nath Kaini has authored more than 500 peer-reviewed papers and manuscripts and 35 book chapters. And not only this, in the course of his career, he's mentored more than 100 uh, fellows and physician scientists. Having met him, it's been an absolute honor and an absolute privilege to have him with us today. He's also honored to have received the Lifetime Distinguished Career Award from the American Academy of Pediatrics and from the International Lysen Committee on Resuscitation. So let's hear what he has to say on the essentials of resuscitation. And we're very, very fortunate to have Dr. Vinay Nathkarni with us. So over to you, Dr. Nathkarni. Well, thank you, Dr. Sidra. And uh, I'm just looking for permission to share the screen as we start our Dr. journey. Dr. Nathkarni, you can please share your screen. Thank you. Uh, one second. Here we go. Well, it's really a great pleasure to kick off the presentation, and thank you very much. Greetings from the United States Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And <clears throat> I have no relevant conflicts, although I sit on, have some research grants and scientific advisory boards. What I thought I would do is set the stage, really, for the next two speakers. First, speaking just for a few moments, about the COVID situation and then transitioning to really focus on simulation and how it might be used. When we think about COVID for a minute, let's think about how we balance the immediate needs of victims and providers, how we balance the resources available and the future resources that might be needed and balance the rationing of scarce resources while trying to salvage the most likely to benefit. Uh, we have, and these slides and all the information will be shared with you and are, will be readily available because we'll be going very quickly. And so um, I'm just going to highlight a few things, but you can look at them in detail in the future if you'd like. Boston Children's Hospital and CHOP have both reported or shared their recent experience with screening for COVID in June. And what I'd like to just point out is that the symptomatic patients who arrive at the hospital have a low but present um, incidence of COVID, different between the two hospitals. And they're screening all of the patients that come to the hospital for admission. And the asymptomatic positivity rate is also quite different, but about 2%. So it's out there. They also shared their concerns and their evolution of their visitation policies 
double rooms, use of N95 mask, aerosol generating procedure approach, testing, and uh, how they discontinue the, the um, isolation for patients. And this information will be shared with you in a PowerPoint and a PDF. The American Heart Association and ILCOR have updated their guidelines for basic and advanced life support. And the key kinds of things that we had to adjust to were how to don PPE, limit personnel in the room, use a mask device with a filter and a very tight seal. And when we move to advanced life support, the prioritization of early intubation during cardiac arrest and using cuffed tracheal tubes for all children, especially using the filter and leaving them on the ventilator. So when we think about changes in guidelines, they're very easy to proclaim. These are the things that we should do and how we should approach the patient in policy and procedure. But when we actually try to implement that, when we actually try to move from the policy and procedure into the practice and safe practice, this is where we start to think about what we do, what we say we do, and what we actually do. A recent publication from a survey that we did of many pediatric intensive care um, units was published in Pediatric Critical Care Medicine just on June 30th. And it suggests that many of the units made no changes in many of their policies, but that some changes were necessary in terms of members and roles of a resuscitation team, use of personal protective equipment, airway and breathing management with the filters and the tight seal, and adjustments to balance the quality of resuscitation with the healthcare provider safety. A very good example, which will be posted in the chat and also uh, available to you in PDF format, is a publication that we just did that showed how the integration of tabletop planning, in situ simulation, debriefing of real cases, and then translation of that back into our policy and procedures could in fact improve processes of care, patient and provider safety and outcomes. But think about your situation. When you're taking care of a patient, there, it is a very complex socio-technical system. A single policy change, a single skill is not going to solve all of the processes that occur. We usually learn in the classroom, train, observe, and then scale to the environment. But with COVID, we've not been able to do that careful and slow development and planning. We've learned by doing, by teaching others, by peer support, peer learning, peer teaching, and peer review. And these are principles that pervade simulation-based education. So we can build upon those skills and use them in the COVID era. If we think about approaches that have been most successful, it has been to take work as imagined, tabletop exercises, discussions about how things should be, policies and procedures. Work as simulated, going into the simulation lab or bringing a simulation to the workplace and running through it and seeing where practice does not meet the expectation and then observing and taking care of patients and reflecting on work as done to feed back so that it becomes a cycle of work as imagined, work as done, work as simulated, all feeding into each other in order to inform the best practice. But what's next? What's coming in the next few lectures and the next few years? We currently think about simulation as a methodology to improve individual skills, teams, and the environment. Simulation is a methodology, not a technology, to replace or amplify real experiences, 
with guided experiences that evoke or replicate realistic world events in an interactive manner. We know that people are trying hard and are well-trained and doing their best. How can we, in fact, improve care? It does require psychological safety. People have to be willing to discuss what they see and feel and reflect. The most important part of simulation is not the mannequin or the simulator. It's really the discussion and the mindful reflection that comes from an experience. There are, of course, many simple and complex types of simulator, and they're used in many different circumstances based on the need and the gap in very varied formats, either as self-directed learning with mechanical feedback for skills, in teams for complex or rare situations, and as Todd will talk about in virtual or augmented reality. The effectiveness of simulation has been demonstrated certainly to improve learners' self-confidence and competence, their skill improvement in simulated settings. And it does, when properly transferred, result in skill improvement in clinical settings. But, does it result in effective care and improved patient outcomes? That is a frontier that is being explored of how to improve the translation into practice and that improved care into better outcomes. One of the benefits of this reflective practice, either in simulation or of real events, is that it allows us to address the learner at every stage of their experience and takes everyone back to the steep point of their learning curve. Peter Weinstock at Boston Children's Hospital and Michael Shepard at Starship Children's Hospital in New Zealand have created a framework, zones of training that focus on the simple end in zone zero focus on skill mastery, individual learners, isolated content, automated feedback, a stop and pause and replay kind of atmosphere up through the full spectrum of full-scale realistic simulation where the why of what people are doing are explored and where the embedded content and the distractions are added like real life and where we pause and reflect and talk about the team and the system and the human factors. The full scale is capable of being trained through thoughtful simulation. At CHOP, we have our simulation center, of course, a traditional simulation palace, if you would. But then we have nodes of simulation and stretch out across the campus and bridge into the real environment with hands-on practice near the point of care, full-scale types of simulations that include PPE and, uh, and full uh, interaction in a real environment with realistic complications. And Mannequins and teams that are just in time and just in place rehearsing what might be happening with the patient in the next room. We've assembled these types of experiences in various ways, including boot camps, where we bring early trainees together to a single location and rehearse the same scenarios. Uh, in fact, even to the point where they can run their codes blindfolded, as you can see in this photo. But most importantly, we bring the training to the bedside in a realistic manner with the real providers to try to understand and train with low-dose, high-frequency training. As we think about simulation, and as you'll hear in just a few minutes, we can use simulation as a training tool 
or as a method to train. Or we can use simulation as we have done with COVID to probe the environment, to study the process, and to replay the root cause and try to improve the process and system of care. Changing what we learn, the latent hazards that await from system failure modes to system improvement modes. We can probe new units, new processes, and in fact, there is data now, Mary Patterson has published, how simulation can be used to detect and uh, prevent safety threats. Mark Arbach and the IMPACTS team have published how they have gone to emergency departments to probe the preparedness with four standardized pediatric cases, adult and pediatric emergency departments for pediatric emergencies. And in fact, we're combining the live capture through videotape of real events with our simulated events to understand them better and to generate report cards of performance like this report card of CPR quality that can be reviewed immediately after event in order to inform the team and the debrief. When we think about COVID, we think about a walkthrough, work as imagined, then simulating that patient or work and workflow, and then examining what happens when real cases come in and having that feedback loop. We might think about patient flow, triage, how we're going to get to radiology, how we will interface with other departments, how we will transfer patients, and how we will protect the staff. For instance, can we create a simulated patient, oncology patient with fever, a child with a fractured arm who has had a COVID contact, or a five-year-old with a wheeze and a fever of moderate severity? How will we handle this? How can we walk through and practice how we would manage this to minimize exposure of the staff and other patients, but still get the time critical interventions to that child? Perhaps we can take a single event and evaluate it, then replay it in simulation and debrief the individual, debrief the team, debrief the system, and then when we have an actual patient care event, we can do the same type of debriefing to inform and improve. When we look at triage and the flow in our EDs and how we separate the COVID patients and generate our online policy procedures and pathways for COVID and non-COVID patients. We took our usual configuration of Code Blue team with so many members in the room. This is an eCPR event that was mapped out by our human factors engineers. And then we had to figure out first on paper how we would reconfigure and then eventually reconfigure the response of the Code Blue team, generating pocket cards that identified roles, based on the simulations that showed that not only could we make a policy that says it should be done, but that it actually could be done. And we discovered that we needed to create new go bags that had some PPE equipment, gowns, and a video laryngoscope in it to facilitate the process and protect the providers. As I turn it over to the next speaker, we want to think about the different ways that we can approach eliminating, substituting, controlling through administrative or engineering controls, and knowing that we can't prepare for everything, we need to train teams to be resilient. We can list the example actions and track them so that we can learn from them. So as I finish, we should, I can just, uh, sort of tell you that there are some key lessons we have learned. One size does not fit all. High quality CPR needs to be practiced and has some minor modifications in the COVID era. Low dose high frequency training works and is necessary to retain the skills. 
doing the training just in time and just in place creates a teachable moment when learners are most receptive to the training. The live capture or discussion of real events and auditing their outcome is very helpful to inform the team. And in certain circumstances like Code Blue, highly practiced teams are very helpful. As we work together, it's not just the process of care that we have to improve, but make sure that it links to patient outcome. And the human factors and teamwork are clearly part of that. Audit and debriefing is the key. So with that, I'll pause here. I'll turn it back to Sidra and listen to the next speakers, and then we can have some questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nath Garni, for such an enlightening overview of resuscitation, especially given the circumstances of the pandemic. I'm sure our um, listeners have uh, a whole lot of questions to ask you, which we'll actually end up taking towards the end. So uh, next we move on to um, Dr. Tor Chang. He's the Divisional Director for Research and Scholarship for the Division of Emergency Medicine at the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles and the Associate Medical Director for the CHLA Simulation Center. Amongst his interests include um, gaming, gamification, and virtual reality. His primary research interest is in judicious use of games and game-based learning for healthcare professionals. So let's give it up to Dr. Tor Chang and see what he has to tell us with regards to gamification, and especially in this um, pandemic scenario. Welcome, Dr. Chang. Over to you. Great. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Sidra and Dr. Nat Carney. Um, Dr. Nat Carney has been my mentor, um, even if you didn't know about it for quite some time, and getting us into the world of simulation and also games. So my name is Todd Chang. I am faculty in the Division of Emergency Medicine at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. We still have a very high, unfortunate COVID population, and it's still growing in our state in California. And so we have some unique changes to our education that we'll talk about here, but in the context of games and simulation. Um, I did have prior grant funding from development of virtual reality, which we'll talk about later, uh, from the National Board of Medical Examiners and Oculus from Facebook. The objectives of this talk include simple things like defining the word games, also gamification, and simulation-based education. And you'll find that these terms overlap quite a bit in terms of a Venn diagram. And then we get to discuss the roles of games and simulation, how it might work for medical education in your discipline or specialty, as well as other disciplines and specialties within your hospital, and particularly during a pandemic like this one. So this sounds very obvious and simple, but we should define what a game actually is. And I think all of us have a general idea of what it is. We probably played some as children and we may play some as adults as well. Um, this is Jane McGonigal. She actually wrote a book called Reality is Broken. Uh, she's not a healthcare worker, um, but she talks about how games make us better and help us learn aside from just having fun and entertain. And in her definition, games have four primary uh, features that you need to meet. Uh, there's also uh, definitions uh, from other scholars and health scholars, and this is a really great one from Dr. Bigdelli, where she actually defines all the possible different types of digital games in medical education. So the four, four traits are, you must have a goal. It doesn't matter what the goal is, whether it's to beat somebody else in a race, accumulate the most points, win a trophy of some sort, or defeat an enemy, a dragon maybe. Um, there have to be rules. We need some level of rules in order to achieve that goal, whether it's to roll some dice, you move pieces, you earn some points and spend some points, you purchase and buy certain things. You also need a feedback system in order to know how close you are or far away from the goal you are. It may be uh, just the number of pieces you remain, it may be the amount of money or points, it may be that you're not quite ready to rescue the princess in Super Mario Brothers. And finally, this fourth one, which is tricky for us, it has to be voluntary, so it cannot be compulsory. 
for most of us in medical education, if we do need to teach, it is a bit compulsory. So this fourth one is a little bit tricky. And this is why when you force a game onto a student, um, it's, you don't have the same effect as if the student chooses to play the game on his or her own. And so this fourth one is the trickiest part when we do simulation and games in a mandatory session. So as my parents said, mandatory fun is neither mandatory nor fun. And one of the key features is that um, winning or having one winner in a game is actually not necessary to have a good game. And so this game in the background for hopefully most of you will know this game called Tetris. Um, none of you in this um, webinar nor anywhere in the world has ever won Tetris because it keeps going infinitely until you eventually lose. But people still play Tetris, have a lot of fun, learn about strategies, even shapes and hand-eye coordination without actually winning. So when you create a game for medical education or even for fun, it's actually not necessary to have a winner at the end. Uh, so that's one of the key features that when you do games for game-based learning, whether it's in a pandemic or not, you do not need uh, to actually win. You do need a goal, but achieving that goal is not necessary uh, in order to have fun and learn from a serious game. Uh, a lot of types of games exist out there, and Dr. Bigdelli actually gives examples of every single one of these. And the two major categories that you should know is the idea of serious games and entertainment games, where Minecraft on the upper left, and perhaps some of your children or yourself play Minecraft. This is primarily an entertainment game. It's meant to entertain and have fun, but you are allowed to as a secondary effect, people can still learn from it, usually learning geometry and physics, uh, sharing resources and those skills, but primarily it is meant to entertain. The difference for the serious game is that it's primarily meant to teach or educate, and then hopefully secondarily, you'll have fun doing it so that people come back. So the game on the lower right that you see is called Cellcraft, which looks like this, and you play an actual cell. You try and make ATP uh, and energy, and synthesize um, proteins before the virus comes over and infects you. So you gain points from creating new organelles and finally uh, mitosing and dividing. And again, this is a serious game because it's primarily meant to teach. It just so happens that it's also a lot of fun, um, but that's a secondary objective of a serious game. You'll also see the term game-based learning. This is a very, very generic term. So if you're using a game, in any way, shape, or form, and you're doing it for learning purposes, whether it's primary or secondary, you're doing game-based learning. And then finally, you'll see the word gamification. It's a very um, trendy, fun word, and there's still debates on what this term means. But generally speaking, gamification is the act of using some game element, but not a whole game, into a context that is not normally a game. For example, if you want your students to attend your lectures, attend your rounds, then you can perhaps do a point system where every time they uh, attend your lecture, they get a point. And at the very end, you show how many points you have, and you have what's called a leaderboard, so you can see a winner and trophies and things like that. Those are game elements, but you're not actually playing a game, but you're adding game elements to make people more motivated. And this effect is called gamification. And there are different game elements that you can do to add to your traditional learning courses to make it either more fun or motivating or easier to absorb certain concepts. So those are the four terms that you, um, uh, that's commonly used in when you use games or serious games in uh, medical education. All right. When we think about games and simulation, uh, most simulations have game elements, and you're going to move from left to right. The principle of games is that you actually do not need to replicate with any reality whatsoever of the thing you are trying to teach. So in this example, if you guys remember Super Mario Brothers, if any of you have been lucky to play the NES or, the, or even the predecessors of Atari, um, these video games had really, really bad graphics, but they were so much fun. 
Um, and then nowadays, when you get towards the more realism, uh, you get to a full-on simulation where we are concerned about having certain levels of realism so that we can replicate the clinical situation that you're trying to uh, teach. Um, and again, games do not have to re resemble anything that it's supposed to teach. So this is chess. Um, this is the European version of chess. But this is supposed to teach um, battle strategy for wartime. And clearly, these pieces have not, don't look like soldiers, don't actually behave like soldiers. But the strategy that you learn from playing chess is replicated uh, in an actual simulation. So you could call this a simulation. But because it has game-like tendencies, you really don't need to go for full realism at all. Um, similarly, this is a video game that we made uh, that replicates a busy emergency department, a uh, busy accident in A&E, for example. And there are certain parts of it. We use cartoons instead of real patients. Um, we use little icons that are a little cute and maybe little animals here and there. Um, but otherwise, uh, you can teach the idea of managing an emergency department without having full-on realism like you might in the uh, simulation. So if you look at the definitions or the traits of games, um, they're very similar to how you might use simulation. Again, Dr. Doug Carney emphasized that simulation is not a technology. It's a method using whatever technology you have. So these principles of having an educational goal, having objectives and rules, and a feedback system, these are things that you normally do in education. All right. So I'm going to give you two examples of some of the, um, using the architecture of games and how it might apply to a pound, teaching a pandemic. And one of the things that Dr. Narcardi left off uh, is the idea of PPE, personal protective equipment, on how to, uh, how to get the providers to use it properly nowadays, which is really important in COVID times. Usually, I think most people learn by maybe watching a video, being forced to watch a video, looking at some pictures. Um, some people will get extra sheets. And then we decided, can you make PPE an actual game? And we're not talking about gamification, where you have these practice sessions where almost every one of us have done. You try it on, and we watch you, and we grade you, and give you feedback. And those have elements of um, games embedded in. But inherently, they're pretty boring. Um, you, even though we know that these are important, uh, important learning points, is there some way to motivate people to learn further and to actually do self-determined learning uh, through this? And that's why we decided to explore games. If you add points, which what most people do, in other words, you make a game mandatory, and when you watch a video, you get an extra point, then the goal of the game is to get as many points as possible, get all the points. If you're teaching PPE, you can make sure that the rules um, adhere to earning points with perfect PPE steps. Gloves, you get one point. A papper, you get two points, et cetera, et cetera, so that you can align the objectives of your educational objectives with the point system. And then the feedback system that most of us use right now is an instructor who's very, very tired. They've looked through 50, 100 people, and they're evaluating the student with a little checkbox. Right. So is this a game? It has game elements, but it doesn't sound like a game. It sounds exactly like a test. Right. So if all you're doing in a game system is just doing checkboxes and points, you're essentially doing nothing more than taking a test. And this is why it doesn't feel like a game. It feels more like work. And you don't get the same fun and the, the, and the, fun and the motivation that you might when you do game-based principles. So this is our, um, I believe this is our neonatal ICU. We've been practicing our COVID simulations in quite a uh, few parts of our hospital as our hospital is uh, still not full capacity yet. It's coming for Los Angeles and I think CHOP had their full capacity quite some time ago. And so we've been preparing with regular simulations like you see here, but we wanted to emphasize how to best use PPE. So, um, the goal for this game or simulation was to intubate an apneic simulated child with the fewest contaminated team members. Well, we wanted to have the, uh, only a few people inside, and we wanted to show how much contamination there was. So the rules that we made was 
that we created simulated virus. So we had fluorinated water inside the mouth of the simulation or of the at regular bursts during the entire scenario. And the team, we allowed the team members wanted, including no PP if they actually wanted to. And then we saw any fluorinated water, simulated virus on them. And this is what it looks like. So we filled the, the mouth of this mannequin. It's a little bit broken now with plastic and this fluorinated water, which is otherwise looks like, like tonic water and um, without the light. You shine a woods lamp or a black light and it suddenly glows in the dark. And so this, this person does not, uh, has a little bit on, of contamination on the bag valve mask on the left here and quite a bit on the patient, although on the patient doesn't really count. So this person gets minus one point for having it on in the bag. And what we did was that this is the only feedback system we have. Instructor said nothing. We just turn and look and count the number of uh, different things, the gloves, the faces, their necks, um, where they had fluoridated water. It allowed them to try again to see if they could beat their score. And again, the instructor did nothing. They, we didn't teach. We didn't say anything, and we allowed them to choose how they did the PPEs. And what happened in the second and third time around is that the fluoridated water actually um, allowed them to see their own mistakes. They had a lot of fun doing it. And the second and third time around, they were much better at the PPE without any of us doing any teaching. So the game, the game elements in the feedback system actually allowed them to see what was wrong. And they adjusted accordingly. We had a fair amount of feedback with that. So, and this is another one of the scenarios that we did um, where they now have used face shields because they realized that their faces were getting covered with virus each time. Um, here's a picture that, we, um, that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine of what it might look like without the with the face shield. So this is the game simulation that we made and we, no longer use much instruction. There may be videos that they can watch, but the game itself is the instruction this time. Um, and we got about five minutes, I think, right? Five minutes, um, three minutes. So the reason this works is that this is a model from uh, Jenny Rudolph in Boston about how simulation is conducted. It's a method of learning. Uh, for most of us, when we start, we talk about actions. We can say, oh, you forgot the oxygen. Don't forget the oxygen next time. Or we can say, oh, you forgot to put the mask. Put on a mask next time. And that's easy to debrief, but that doesn't actually get to the root of the problem. So what we normally ask is to explore the frame. Why did we forget? We're all good nurses and good physicians. We know it on the test, but why do we keep forgetting in the real situation? And sometimes the exploring the frames is actually the root of the problem. Oh, it was very difficult to hear. I didn't want to say anything because that's my boss or that's my attending or consultant. I don't want, I, I don't feel like I should correct him or her. And then that's the frame that you get to address where you can say, well, um, if the attending or uh, the consultant's too busy, it's still helpful to help them out. And that frame shift can actually lead to new actions. And what happens with the game is that the game can create new frames. Um, we use fluoridated water without any feedback. That becomes the feedback that people use so that we know that the emphasis is on preventing the virus from spreading to us. And that changes the way that we behave in terms of actions by choosing better PPE and stronger um, uh, PPE use. Um, shifting gears just for a little bit, uh, we also know that um, digital simulations are also used quite a bit for um, during the pandemic because it's harder to uh, it's harder to do uh, live simulations. And so this is a VR version that we've been producing. Um, because I live in Ho um, I live in Hollywood essentially, so we're next to actors and writers all the time. We actually were able to hire a company with some grant funding to take pictures of our emergency department. Um, this is motion capture that we did where we pretended to be uh, acting. And then they became our individual, so we became each of these characters in the virtual reality. 
So this particular version, the game, is that we wanted to insert a lot of stress. We wanted our learners to learn what it's like to calm down, to manage the stress, and manage otherwise a simple um, farewell seizure while people were still yelling at you because it was so stressful. So the goal was to manage a seizure. The rules were uh, you got minus one point for any delays, and the environment was that all four of these characters were crying, screaming, um, and not being very helpful for the simulation. <laughs> Um, and then we were able to replicate this in real life. This is our research um, coordinator who's much happier than the nurse on the left. And you're seeing different things um, when we do VR where you use the rules of the game, right? The, uh, the four elements, including the voluntary aspect. But then um, you see different things. Uh, for, for example, in this view, Dr. Nat Carney was using simulation to look at root cause analyses. These are two viewpoints when we use virtual reality. The one on the left is somebody who's very tall. The one on the, uh, the right is someone who's very short. They're both good physicians, but when we start this scenario, each of these two people saw two different scenarios, even though the patient was the same. And on the right, you can see that the, the short person can see the clock, but they, they had a harder time seeing the monitor, which is off the screen on your upper right. And so the shorter physician had trouble managing the vital signs because they just couldn't see them. Uh, whereas the taller person had a head start on the vital signs. And they couldn't see other things. And so they, both of these physicians managed the patient very differently. And during debriefing, it was unclear why they were so different until we saw the screen and saw the virtual reality um, viewpoint of what they saw. And so we can use this to, again, understand and see the framework of why they're behaving differently, whether they're doing it during, differently during a pandemic or not. So those are some examples. There's lots to um, share, of course, about games and simulation. Um, this is a QR code on the video that we made um, to uh, talk about our virtual reality. And I'm happy to answer any questions at the end as well. I'll hand it back to Dr. Sidra. Thank you, Dr. Torrid. You actually took us to the world of Tetris and Super Mario, so that was a big respite in itself. So, um, well, this world of gamification is so fascinating. I'm sure we have a lot of questions coming up. So, uh, next we have with us Dr. Sujata Thayagrajan, and she's working as a consultant um, of the ICU and Pediatric Emergency Department at Rainbow Children's Hospital, Bangalore, India. And she's also the founder, past president, and current secretary of Petty Stars. And uh, we welcome her here to talk to us about um, her interest, that's pediatric trauma and simulation, and what is it like um, developing and uh, actually initiating simulation in a resource limiting setting like ours. So over to you, Dr. Sajata. Dr. Sajata, your mic is on mute. Yeah, thank you. Good evening, everybody, and thanks, Dr. Sidra, for this wonderful opportunity. Um, let me just uh, share my screen. Yeah. So we had a fantastic talk from uh, Dr. Vinay Natkarni and uh, Todd Chang, taking us to the world of, uh, you know, uh, simulation into a different arena altogether. Now we're going to have a reality check of how we do in resource-limited settings uh, during the COVID season. So I just want to remind us all that, uh, you know, this tiny virus took us from being experts to novice right now, where we hardly knew anything about this disease pathophysiology or, uh, you know, the treatment strategies. And we now had to prepare for this amidst social distancing and also having the time challenge of preparing our teams. Um, when I was mentioning about the zones of learning as what uh, Peter Weinstock and Mike Shepard developed, um, yes, during simulation, we were used to training our uh, team members, something like what you see on the right side of your screen, to making novel changes like what you see on the left side of the screen, and we had to start from scratch. So we were like turned into from how and why to, you know, uh, how to do it. So yes, the challenges were great, but so are our opportunities to improve. So what did we do? And I wanted to share about our Pedista's experience here. 
So we started from step one, where we reviewed our guidelines, identified our uh, needs, and then designed scenarios, basically focusing on various different types of learners, what skills they need to learn, and also the location of training. We disseminated our scenarios to facilitators attached to us, and um, we conducted something like a similar thon, which I'll talk a little bit uh, later on, um, sometime during 20th of April to 20th of May this year. And we had ongoing support to make sure that we learned how to do the simulation and uh, have a continuous learning. So uh, when I shared with you how the guidelines actually changed, so we reviewed the guidelines to see how to design our scenarios for simulation. And we borrowed this checklist from uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia as well. So we shared these resources and did our needs assessment. What we found was, you know, things such as, um, you know, PPE, donning and doffing skills and doing it in, in a timely fashion and um, some new adaptations for aerosol precautions, how to actually use a viral filter, how to create a barrier for intubation, how to use video laryngoscopes, the new code blue rules for CPR and how to do it with minimal staff, how to make sure that there is distance team leading. People still heard how to do things in amidst wearing the PPE in the tents setup and uh, the logistics such as transport, how to do video monitoring, waste management, how to ensure that PPE was available, not just for clinical care, but also for simulation training, and then how to provide this training. So I think when I mentioned about task training, team training, systems testing, and now we had an additional thing, which was distance learning, video training or telesimulation. So um, we designed our scenarios essentially uh, based on these uh, aspects of task and team training and also to be conducted, say, in the emergency setup or in the PICU setup. And we did some email to our facilitators um, and we surveyed our participating centers, not just from within India, but also from across the world through that IPP, IPSS and Inspire Network. So just a word about uh, what Simulathon is all about. So we coined this term essentially to mean that it's a coordinated thematic simulation activities that take place concurrently, usually over a specific time frame, say a day, week or month, and at multiple healthcare centers. So to tell us about our experience of uh, you know, conducting this kind of Simulathon in situ, we started in 2016 for a world uh, trauma uh, day on October 13th. So we started with how good are we in primary and secondary assessment of uh, the next year we improvised on to find out how good we were in managing major hemorrhage and whether we had policies in ER for that. In 2018, in association with Society of Simulation in Healthcare, we did the sepsis week where we looked at septic shock management. In 2019, we tried to find out about how good we are in our resuscitation. And we had a challenge across the teams in uh, India where they had to demonstrate the time to defibrillation and they could show with rapid cycle deliberate practice and also introducing a CPR coach. They were able to actually improve the time to defib from four and a half minutes to less than two minutes. And in 2019, later in the year, we did a communication training week uh, along with Society of Simulation in Healthcare. And on this occasion, we applied the SPIKES protocol. So there were various learning points that we had, and these coordinated activities have been well taken by our uh, simulation facilitators within India. So for this time, you know, COVID uh, preparedness, this was something totally new to us. We had never tried for, uh, you know, a pandemic situation, but we were willing for this challenge. So we started with you know, how to make simulation cost effective and also be a quality improvement tool within our country. So we started with something like skills training. We did some team training and systems testing. So the few things that we looked at for the skills training was 
how to make sure that we use limited material and still gain mastery in PPE, uh, donning and doffing. An important uh, thing that was taken up well was the time challenge for donning PPE. There was a, you know, um, a challenge board kept in each of the wards where staff were asked to kind of, you know, time themselves for uh, wearing the, for donning the, uh, the PPE, especially for the code blue members because they had to do it real fast. Um, and then about intubation with aerosol precautions and how we adapted our environment and equipment for that and the new practice of code blue where we had to practice our skills to mastery because we had very little time and then we had team training in situ because now the uh, environment was different the adaptation of wearing the ppe and still doing it and we had to do it with low cost without wasting too much of ppe and then the system testing we had created new pp uh, new covid wards covid icu areas so the layout had changed we had to change the way we were going to address the families so we did the training about all of these through systems so some adaptations that we did for ppe as you can see we used simple methods we used something like a checklist we created videos so that could uh, help them to uh, you know learn how to do it rather than demonstrating each time and wasting the PPE uh, for that. We did a lot of interdisciplinary training, including the healthcare workers, especially the uh, housekeeping staff uh, who would do the cleaning up and also the nursing staff. Then this time challenge for the ER and Code Blue teams. There was a PPE uh, competition as well. And we came up with a concept called PPE coach or a buddy who could actually ensure there is adequate PPE, uh, you know, donning and doffing technique. Um, how to actually task train to mastery. So using, uh, you know, targetedly. So we had low cost simulators, airway mannequins, where we could teach them how to use cluster swab collection, how to use, uh, you know, in situ simulation, you know, in situ suction with viral filters, how to make sure that we are actually not, uh, you know, disconnecting the circuits at any time and then use of laryngoscopes for uh, intubation. So each of these techniques were practiced to mastery. Some low cost adaptations of how to actually, um, you know, transport them safely. So we used a thin transparent sheet across the transport trolley and learned how to do it. And how to keep the simulation as real as possible with low cost, uh, you know, adaptations. So these are like DIY, you know, do it yourself barriers that were created. So you can see various adaptations by uh, quite a few of our team members across India. We used even a simple like airway mannequin that you get replaced pillows and then covered it up. So this still looks like a, a, a big person and provides that realism. We had our, uh, you know, uh, participants wearing simple things like transparencies and connecting the tapes to them and providing the you know wiser look for all of them we use simple fabric bags to convert them into n95 and give that realistic look for ppe and uh, these are the wards covid wards or triage area which we did simulation on to make sure that we could uh, you know probe our systems for logistics and then uh, in these pictures of how education was done across India. So you can see different adaptations. You can even see how we use a simple cling film or a transparent sheet to make sure the aerosol, uh, you know, precautions were done. So different adaptations here. And we have a WhatsApp group of all our facilitators across India. And I'm just sharing a few things of how we actually managed the WhatsApp support. So we shared lots of resources. You can see we shared things about, we conducted a webinar about how can simulation help thanks to Vinay and my and Rakshai, who kind of went through their experience of how to conduct it in situ uh, to lots of our facilitators during the Simulathon week uh, and the month. We had resources on how to conduct you know, uh, code blue. 
and also you know how to communicate wearing PPE. So lots of resources being shared. And then we share our experiences regularly. So each unit share their pictures and their learning points, you know, to see how they managed on each of these situations. And it's a good kind of motivating thing for many of them. And we actually support each other by congratulating and, you know, learning from each other how we actually made a difference in patient care, as you can see in the right side. And lots of solutions, say, for example, what if we start simulation, then we shared, you know, resources about virtual CPR, which uh, Todd was just, uh, you know, mentioning about how to do video resuscitation, you know, lots of resources for people who could not conduct in situ simulation. So how did we do? Are we really comparable to what when I spoke or Todd spoke? So just for, uh, you know, we uh, conducted a survey of all participants across the world and also, uh, you know, uh, within India to just find out really how they did their simulation. We asked only simple seven questions of how many participants, whom did they train, who were their facilitators, and, you know, what were their learning points, what were the gaps that they identified, so, and what were their plus points. So, People who replied to our survey, I'm just sharing that information. So it's almost represented across the world, all the six continents. And um, in, I'll share you uh, some more details about this. And within India, the breakup of where we were, we are always south heavy with simulation. And I come from Bangalore Downs here, where almost nine centers did the simulation. So the maximum happened in Bangalore. So we were able to train nearly 650 doctors about 558 nurses and 203 uh, support staff with very minimal facilitators that we have, about 76 doctors, 38 nurses. So majority of them were conducted in the emergency department and in the PICU. Um, the blue bars are all the Indian data and the red bars are all the global data. So as you can see, the rest of the world did majority in other areas as well especially the wards. So the professionals trained, we were really very comparable to majority of the centers, but with regard to interprofessional training or the uh, training of support staff, we were much less compared to the rest of the world. But the proportion of facilitators across the world and India, we are nearly half of what we had in the rest of the world. You know, we have lots of resources in the world, but within this limited thing, how did we fare? You know, are we really able to manage COVID patients following simulation? So if we look at our preparedness, the blue area sees, you know, majority of the centers within India said that they feel prepared, you know, following their simulation exercise. And some data about, you know, the not sure were because those centers felt that they were not yet designated as COVID training center, uh, treating centers. So some plus and delta points, basically what were the plus points that we were able to pick up because of our simulation. We were able to practice our clinical protocols. You know, the stakeholders were able to refine their processes. We were able to adapt with low tech simulation and we were able to do distance learning, identify some latent threats, rectify them well in time due to simulation. And we were able to address our staff queries especially, you know, improving their uh, confidence. Um, the delta or the gaps that we found was still, in spite of all the simulation, there were some knowledge gaps and perf performance gaps that needed to be addressed, especially something related to the donning doffing, you know, and how difficult communication was and the adaptation of like coming up with, you know, the sign boards or languages for it looking at the transport flow and coming up with solutions for that and ability to conduct multiple sessions because there's rapidly changing guidelines and then customize some COVID equipment, making sure that the availability of PPE was uh, you know, there for not just the clinical care, but also for simulation. And the most important challenge we had was the availability of facilitators and their time and the availability of participants because of staff conservation. 
So some key learning points during simulation was uh, implementing these new code rules with you know, customized equipment, using different gestures for communication during PPE, having a PPE coach, you know, more practice opportunities, ability to conduct multiple location in situ simulation practice, team preparedness, importantly, psychological safety of team members. One of the important learning points has been, though, the utilization of resources such as videos and distance learning. So, with that, I'd like to say that you know, simulation has safety. This is a picture on the left hand side where the team was practicing with a simulator, and on the right side, you can see their reflection in uh, managing the real patient. With this, I'd uh, like to conclude my talk and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Sajata, for giving us um, a brilliant overview of simulation and resource-limited setting. And um, the questions that we've been receiving, they pretty much pertain to, you know, how if we were to initiate in a setting like ours. So I'm sure there must have been a lot of roadblocks and a lot of glitches. So we'll um, probably hear um, a lot more on that from you. So um, uh, a very big thanks to all our speakers. And now we'll um, take some questions. With me, I have my um, colleague, Dr. Navidur Rahman, and um, he and I um, will be moderating the questions. So, um, so we have a question for Dr. Vinay here. And uh, so the question says, how does one ensure adherence to PALS while you're practicing mock drills and resuscitation? And, uh, and how do you think that's important, especially in, um, you know, in a crisis-like setting? A great question. One quick comment after hearing the, the um, presentations, um, it may seem like the, uh, the presenters have a very resourced and almost overwhelmingly amount of support. But uh, Sujatha can probably confirm that much of this is doable in your own center with very simple, cheap tools and a WhatsApp connection. It doesn't need anything fancy to get done. But to come to your question about PALS, um, I think with simulate, we have moved from enforcing strict uh, sort of uh, OSCEs almost, where you must do this in this sequence, in this order, with simulation in the trenches, we've become much more about trying to accomplish the task with a algorithm as a guideline and appropriate deviations. We really work more on understanding how people use the algorithm to get to the purpose at hand, understanding why they do and don't. And I think Todd and Sujatha will probably agree that we spend about as much time or maybe a little more time on what went right on, on how they accomplished something that was difficult to accomplish and how bringing out how the team was able to do that rather than only focusing on what went wrong, fix it. Because when we concentrate on just fixing the immediate issue we saw, hey, put your hand here, not there. We don't really understand why they put their hand here, not there. And there probably was a good reason in their mind or they just forgot and they needed to be reminded, but we understand it better. So we've gone from going to protocol enforcement, what you did wrong and fix it, to understanding what will accomplish the task at hand and why that's important. Thank you. Dr. Navid, you would like to take um, questions for Dr. Vinay before we move on to questions for Dr. Dorden. Yeah. So uh, uh, thanks very much. Uh, uh, I'm really thankful to Gwene as well as Todd and Sujatan uh, for giving us a uh, remarkable and uh, uh, tremendous uh, presentation. And uh, the question for Gwene uh, is uh, in situ, uh, uh, what do you think about in situ versus center-based simulation? What, uh, which in your experience is better? Well, I love both in situ and in the center. I think they have slightly different purposes and different 
pros and cons. So if we're running a course like PALS, if we're doing basic training, if we're really trying to get people out of the environment to concentrate on the learning they're doing for a prolonged period of time, we find the simulation center is really a great place for that. We run our boot camps in those kinds of environments, our PALS courses. But when we want to do just in time, when we want to do a refresher, when we want to understand how the environment the person works in will work with their team in the environment that they'll be taking care of the patient, then we must go to the bedside and there Insight you has a great advantage. So really it's the fit to purpose, making sure that your environment and resources are fit to the needs analysis and the objectives of your simulation. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to uh, another question for uh, uh, Todd. Uh, uh, how does uh, one improve engagement through gamification? Um, that is a very, very good question. People do entire PhDs and careers on this. Um, because games by themselves are, uh, have not been shown in the literature to do permanent engagement. Um, if you think about, for example, I hope everyone knows Pokemon, right? Um, if you think of Pokemon, the reason Pokemon is still successful is that they keep coming up with new Pokemon every day, it seems like, um, because the, the Pokemon game, the most popular game in the world, which was Pokemon Go, People don't play it anymore. Well, now because you can't go outside because of COVID, of course, but every, even an entertainment game, the most best games will have a peak and then they just stop being fun because it's no longer novel or interesting or new and you need a new game thereafter. So a single game, Vinay has some Pokemon advice. That you have. <laughs> a single game is not, ne um, is not sufficient to have magical um, engagement. So we actually published a CPR study where we used a very complex um, game system with badges and points and an opportunity for people to do selfies, um, which many young people <laughs> like these days. And we actually got great engagement for about three months and then it was not as interesting anymore. And it became less of a game and more mandatory. If you remember the fourth trait of a game, it should be voluntary. So as soon as they realize, oh, my teacher is making me play this game, or my parent is making me uh, do this chore, then it, you lose that engagement. So in, to can answer I, to your question, yeah. Can, can I ask you, um, uh, my finger was up because I was asking about engagement. Across, yeah. oh. maybe across generations, like how do you approach it? Maybe um, uh, some people are not even comfortable with a QR code or with any sort of uh, game experience, but other people in the group might be gamers and really um, experiencing that. How do you engage across the spectrum of people who might be resistant to game, you know, sort of what we think of as gaming? Sure. Um, so kind of tie in both the question of improving engagement, people respond differently to game. Um, some, uh, and it's actually difficult to predict now um, based on age alone. We, you cannot assume that a young person likes games. Um, many of them do not, um, or at least the games that we want to provide as serious games for education. And sometimes, most surprisingly, are the older folks who, um, we have a couple of professors who have you know, very big gray beards and they're very mean and uh, very, you know, very great people, but you do not think of them as playing games. And then we opened up a game with, um, literally it was Pokemon and uh, anatomy games. And these are 70 year old men who you would respect in a town council and all of a sudden they're playing games and it was so much fun to watch them. So it's very unpredictable who's going to like a game and who will not. And if you think of simulation as not a technology, but a modality, same thing with the game. The game is also a modality that may or may not work for certain educational objectives. And it's only one of many tools that you can use. So um, don't, pre don't do not assume based on age and um, always have more than one modality or more than one game type 
in order to have one learning uh, objective. All right, uh, uh, we have another question for you uh, from the audience. Uh, uh, what roadblocks and challenges uh, you have faced uh, to implement the gamification? Um, I think, well, this is a good question for all three of us. Um, even though I know Dr. Sujata and Dr. Vinay and I have made it, our presentations look like we do this all the time and it's very easy and, and everyone loves us. Not everyone loves us um, because we also compete with their time. There's, they're busy. There's lots of patients to take care of. They have to study for other things. Um, so we have to constantly provide a value. So we have to showcase value and sometimes the value is money. Sometimes the value is proof that a patient is getting better. And um, that's one of the barriers that we face is we constantly have to provide some sort of proof. And the type of proof or evidence that we need may not be the, the one that we think is the proof. So, for example, in our hospital, um, we are currently needed to prove our monetary value in terms of cash and dollars. And because of COVID, we can't offer many courses. So um, we can't charge people for money for courses and to make money off of that way. So how do you showcase money? And we've decided that we, um, we've we turned things around with our gaming and our VR saying that we don't make money and that's okay, but we save money in these areas where you didn't think we could save money. And so here are the three areas that we think you can save money where you traditionally spent lots of money with PPE for training, but guess what? Our game does not use PPE that's real. So you're going to save, you know, 10,000 US dollars not having to pay for extra masks because we use virtual masks in this training. Um, and that was a weird way of showing case value for um, overcoming that barrier. But one of the barrier that I constantly come up with is to prove the value. And especially because when I say the word game, people don't take me seriously. People really think that I play with Pokemon all day. And, um, and sometimes you have to go out of your way to say, no, no, we're not just playing with toys. Um, this isn't just children in a children's hospital playing with games. This is real um, learning and real frameworks that's novel, innovative, and different. And we have to constantly prove that in different ways. I would agree that time and dollars, time and money are probably the two biggest barriers, but, um, uh, and also the inability to shed ineffective, um, so ineffective education for effective education. So we might do all this extra simulation and it might be accomplishing the task, but people still have requirements. Oh, you must go to this mandatory class. Oh, you must do this test. Oh, you must do that. And so, um, even though we've demonstrated that that other thing is not very effective, um, it still seems to, they have to do this on top of what they're doing instead of instead of what they're doing. Okay. And that is a barrier. And I wonder for Sujata, you probably have a lot more experience where people say, you've got millions and millions of patients in India. Why do we need this mannequin? Why, why should we be practicing this on mannequins and stuff? Because we got patients. We should just do it on patients. Yeah. I agree, Vinay, and majority of the government institutions still kind of could not, uh, you know, implement this as such. But having said that, you know, we had a little advantage of lockdown. And I think the, um, you know, COVID problem occurred in India only from March. So we had about three months of lag period where we got to know about Spain, about US and about Italy. And that really scared the people like anything here. And we were like preparing for as if we were preparing for war. And um, almost every healthcare worker was quite scared. And so we had to come up with, you know, lots of guidelines and review them. Even to design the scenarios, it took time. So although the thought of doing a, you know, simulathon was there in the, you know, beginning of the month, we took some time because we had to like go through the scenarios, refine them, try it out ourselves in our setup before we disseminate to the rest of the country. So there was a lot of you know hard work that needed to be done. 
but the demand was very high interestingly you know everybody started asking us you know have you got protocols in your center and have you got you know what type of simulation are you doing and can you guide us and so it was a lot of pressure for us from peristars to actually make sure that we got it right in terms of uh, you know so that way the covid uh, situation was not having so much of a concern about you know we have real patients why should we simulate that was not a major concern this time the major concern however what we had was staff availability you know so everybody was asked to conserve their staff so there was like different shift short shifts and everybody had to like you know stay at home and do lot of things so we had to come up with adaptations for that then the resources you know so we had very limited pp at that time you know there was no in house uh, preparation uh, you know availability of pp local manufacturers had to like come up with pp so lots of indigenous products got innovated during that time and so we still had to train our people so i showed you a fabric bag that we carry it's a carry bag that we use for our uh, you know lots of common things and people just came up with those kind of adaptations even like coming up with the ppe suits just for practice we came up with certain items that we could use but we conserved it very very uh, in a targeted way so skills for ppe donning doffing had only the senior most members who could be acting as ppe coach they had perfect training to mastery the others had to try it only once and then you know they were given these ppe coaches to actually make sure that they would do it in the real situation then we just did it with the, you know all the ppe the team training only once or twice and the remaining practice sessions of refinement happened without you know the full pp they were still trying different types of like visors which they had come up with innovatively so the low cost ones they used the simple transparencies with the mask attached to it punched into it and then they would tie it so they had all these different adaptations that they could do so all these were being shared within the whatsapp group and that gave people some idea to make sure that okay if this unit can do it why can't we and then they came up with new innovations so that really helped us to kind of make it successful for us here so in terms of your question of what roadblocks we had and uh, you know so and also i think dr sidra's question about uh, you know how do we make it uh, you know practical for uh, a setup like in pakistan yeah yeah, yeah. so uh, a few things that we did was you know because our strength has been our whatsapp group because everybody looks into it and they kind of learn from each other there's a lot of motivation that we do and we share our resources so that has been our strength to beat the roadblocks and we came up with certain strategies for like you know resources for virtual simulation as as well so i think one of the centers subsequently which was not part of the simulathon but subsequently adapted the vr model in their center and uh, they presented in one of our webinars all right uh, uh, we have another question from the audience for rupine uh, that how to improve communication between the team members during resuscitation especially in covid patients a great question this was one thing that we dramatically changed throughout as our covid experience progressed and i think sujatha mentioned it in her talk as well that uh, with all the ppe and masking we had a lot of difficulties with communication muffled voices lack of expression reading etc so we went to moving many members outside of the room uh we developed a system with uh ipads that we could have an ipad in the room and outside the room where we could one person could type or say or show with the camera to the people outside the room the orders could be put in outside the room etc and uh in fact the team leader the coach the attending physician could stand outside the room with visualization of what was going on and do the do the uh organization so we definitely found that we had to adjust the communication style during resuscitation events and uh we also have used uh 
with the code team, with members that we know are going to be there, we use specific buzzwords. So we have some words which everybody knows the meaning of down to one word that is kind of like a, a play for a, for, a, um, for a football team or a, you know, where they know the play. And we also okay. used a few hand gestures to indicate what's going to happen. I think, Sujata, you had the same experience, yes? Yeah, the gestures, and actually we didn't have the luxury of iPads, but we had handwritten orders which were being displayed. Uh, and I put a picture in one of the slides, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and here in California, we had the fortunate accident of being one of the last places to have COVID. So as everyone else was struggling with COVID, we were practicing with no, almost like one COVID patient in March. And instead of telling them how to do communication, we decided to simulate uh, in inside you. We closed the door on the two teams and we said, okay, you now need to communicate and with no rules. Again, kind of like the, the PPE game where you tell them the goal of communication, but you don't tell them how to do it. And we had several teams who had very innovative ideas, which included trying to use telephones, calling each other, and coming up with hand gestures. Um, some of them are silly, um, but others actually really worked. And from those ideas, we decided to then take the best ideas of several simulations and turn them into policy. So we now have a clipboard in, on the inside and outside with some general pictures. So there's a picture of help. There's a picture of um, chest compressions uh, so that sometimes you don't even know that there's CPR on the inside if you're standing on the outside because it's so quiet. Mm -hmm. And so in order to communicate That's these true. things, we have about three or four major pictures that you can um, show from the inside that you can see. So a lot of pictures, a lot of hand gestures, but we were able to discover them slowly as people tried them out, found out that some did not work um, and others did. It's really a very interesting thing that COVID has perhaps pioneered for the new normal, which may be an improvement. Instead of waiting for organizations like the American Heart Association to come out with PALS courses and tell you what to do, instead we're, we're sharing experiences and we're learning. We're, like Sujata is saying, we're sending out a scenario to probe your environment and figure out what your problems and your solutions might be. And Todd is saying that we're widely sharing potential solutions that have worked in other places, but then using simulation to try them on to see what works in your environment. It's really a new paradigm, and it's, it's kind of rapidly sure. promoted simulation to a point because it's now necessary in order to contextualize these guidelines to practice. Is there like a specific um, series of webinars or maybe like, you know, some um, collaborative thing that we could possibly be a part of and learn this if we were to start it at our center? Um, I'm sure Dr. Naveed would agree and um, we would pretty much, oh, sure. I think, uh, you know, especially in a COVID, not, not just like a COVID setting, but anywhere else as well. This is something that seems very fascinating. And uh, so a question to all of you is like, if we were to initiate something like this in our part of the world, so how do you, how do you suggest we start? Like what, what should be the initiating factors? Start small and practical, but start. I would say use, share and use the PD stars, um, format is probably a, a good kind of developmental kind of pragmatic approach. There will be political barriers. There will be, you know, difficulties in, in, um, in duplicating or sharing just because of the political situations in the world. But um, Inspire, I would say IPSS and Inspire probably have the collection, at least for pediatrics, of all of the people who I'm sure would want to help get you started. But I think if you have a small core network of interested folks, the way PD Stars started, Sujata, correct me if I'm wrong, is they had a very few, maybe five or 10 people who were really interested and they formed a core group and they met regularly and they 
tried a few things on. And as they had a few successes, they shared it with their friends and the, and it kind of expanded that way. If you try to start too big and all inclusive, it will be overwhelming and you just will stay up all night working all the time and you'll feel as if you're getting nothing done. Yeah, because we have we have an excellent center simulation here that recently got accredited as well. So I think this is probably a perfect moment to start now that we have a very good orientation. So we'll definitely discuss it amongst our folks and then get back to you on how to go about it. So another question for you, Dr. Vinay, was um, video laryngoscope versus a gladioscope. Which mm -hmm. one is better, especially while you're intubating a patient with suspected COVID, let's say? Which one have you practiced with? That's the best one. <laughs> so that makes sense. Really, um, uh, most of that de depends on your environment, what you have available, and what you uh, what you use regularly, and what you can train people to use. The exact tool is probably not as important as the training on that tool. There are a few things with the older glide scopes because of the curvature of the blade. For the very young children, they tend to push the anterior a little, the airway a little more anterior. And the, the, um, like the glide scope is a little, is not used exactly like a direct laryngoscope would be used. So it needs training in order to facilitate the passage of the tube. But I don't think any specific manufacturer or tool is better than another. It's mostly how you use it and how you train on it. Todd, you have some experience in that area also with a video laryngoscopy. What do you think? Yeah, so I unfortunately have both real patient experience and simulated experience. But as Vinay said, it's actually less about the technology than whatever it is that gets your intubation on your first try, that is the best and safest. Right. It's actually the most dangerous if you intubate or fail and then you pull it out and then spray the entire COVID into the room. So if it's direct laryngoscope only and you can do the best in there, then by all means, please do direct laryngoscope. And so what we've tried to do is to have people discover their intubation preferences. Uh, I know that um, I'm part of the old people, so the old people like the direct laryngoscopes before video laryngoscopes were invented. I personally don't know how to use a glide scope, whereas my colleagues are very good at it. So we have everything ready in the clinical setting of whichever, whoever is working that day will use whatever they're most familiar with. Um, but the opportunities to train is more important than the sticking with everybody is forced to use glide scope or everyone's forced to use CMAC. Uh, I, we think that the choice per the, um, because our hands are different, some of us are very strong, some of us need extra help, um, but it's all about the child. So it doesn't matter what the, um, without the policy, it's really about our best success rate uh, for keeping the COVID inside the, the trachea instead of out into the world. And Sidra, we've also made a switch um, it, in our training environment in our hospital as a training institution, we used to have the least experienced intubator be the person who took the first try. But now in the COVID era, we've switched to the most experienced, the most likely to get it in on the first job is doing that. Now that may not be long-term good for training, but it is good probably for exposure and patient care and current staff. Yeah, that's exactly what we've also switched practice to, to start with the most experienced, experienced ones. So one last question for you, Dr. Torres. is um, there's this question that are these games readily available or can we have access to the games? This is from one of our participants. Um, sure. So there are some of us who work in the games research um, uh, are part of companies uh, and they own the company and they want to make money. Those people will not give them to you for free. Um, and you have to buy them. And some of them are reasonable price. Um, I am an independent researcher, so I never get paid for the games that we make. Um, but uh, that also allows me to have free samples and free games. So if you're interested, there's actually um, quite a few people um, from uh, the, our virtual reality game has um, free versions that we can have you guys try out. Um, they're from London. And so um, we're happy to uh, connect you to them. Um, 
And then there's some paid versions where if it's just a paid by the hospital, so it's not per person by any means. And yeah, so there's a quite a lot of different games. Many of them are very specific goals or different topics. So um, choose which ones that you like. And um, yeah, if you if you can give me some emails, um, I'll I'll have some recommendations of what I personally feel is appropriate or has highest yield and some publications on some of the games so you can choose if you feel that the game is worth it. Yes. Oh. To Sidra and Nabid, could I, for the last, I know you're short on time, but could I just turn it around to ask you with your knowledge of Pakistan and the people who are on the call, on the, on the meeting, um, what, um, what would be most helpful to you to move to move this forward? Like, what do you think are the most important things you guys need, perhaps from people like us or people we would know? I think if we were to start off with, it's probably gonna be something that's simulation based, especially the resuscitation thing that you mentioned. So any innovation in simulation is something would be like a good start. And then probably moving on to virtual reality and gamification, that of course is gonna come in. But um, having said that, I think simulation uh, would be probably the best uh, way where we would actually uh, like you guys to teach us and, you know, um, facilitate as to how to take that, that bit of it forward, because that is, um, that is something that we think uh, we actually should be doing. I do agree with uh, uh, Sildra that uh, uh, currently uh, uh, we do have to start uh, the uh, simulation uh, in terms of uh, uh, resuscitation, especially in the COVID era, uh, which we are currently lacking. And uh, hopefully I will be joining soon. Uh, so hopefully uh, we're gonna start it. And uh, wherever we were going to uh, 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 be needing, uh, any help and definitely we're going to approach you guys. I, I think it would, I would advise if you can, um, if all the people listening can contribute, if you can develop a WhatsApp group or if you can share your successes, I, I simulate, I changed the policy. I simulated this. I trained people and we got a patient with COVID and we managed them well. You can share those stories about yeah. what worked then you can and keep those those will be like gold where you can learn from each other but you also will develop a publishable sure. uh you know information that will help others yeah, that uh, sounds sure. like a fantastic suggestion so i think we're a little over time a minute over time i once again want to thank each one of you for your time um, and for uh, speaking to us and um, about all of these things. So we would like to close with, um, we have our service line chief, Dr. Ali Fessel, and we have our um, division chair, Dr. Salman Kirmani with us, and um, they would like to say a few words. Dr. Ali and Dr. Salman, if I may request you to um, close the session. Thank you so much for doing this. <laughs> So oh, yeah, yeah you do it was, together. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, our privilege. Our He's privilege. Mask, I'm not because I'm just protected by by his <laughs> wearing a mask. <laughs> so thank you very much, uh, Todd, uh, uh, Vinay, and Sujata. It's really great to hear from you. A uh, lot of learning, I would say. We are not as such a CI, uh, you know, like simulation-based country. Uh, we are still learning. We have just started our simulation-based uh, area in our, in our university. And uh, with all these learning you have and giving to our colleagues, Naveed and Sidra and other colleagues as well, who's, who's hearing this on this talk, I would say uh, this, is, this is just a beginning, right? Um, because we expect a lot of uh, sort of pandemic, hopefully not, but if something happened, we should be very prepared for that. And I think all these things materialize when all of us join our hands together and learn from each other experience. And I really like when the winner said that, American Academy, American Heart Society, AHA has come up maybe later, but we actually start working the way we are doing right now. Uh, I'm happy to tell you that a lot of things which you have suggested, we are starting in a beginning phase, but we actually start doing it. Um, so, 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 you want to add something? I'm sorry, I missed the whole thing. I was just caught up with something else. Yeah. But uh, I'm hoping this is going to be one of many more that we can do together, right? Yeah. Very good. Terrific. Okay. Thank you, everybody. And I Thank think you. it was a terrific session.
So our next session is going to be on um, July 10th. This is Friday, and we'll have Dr. Arun Bansal with us. And uh, he shall be talking about preparedness and management in a resource-limited setting. So we'll see you again on Friday evening. Thank you. Take care. Goodbye. Bye-bye now. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.